You're listening to Space Time, Series 20, Episode 97, for publication on the 20th of December, 2017. Coming up, Voyager 1 fires its thrusters after 37 years, America going back to the moon as well as Mars and beyond, and we check out this week's science report. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. If you tried to start a car that's been sitting in the garage for decades, you might not expect the engine to respond. But a set of thrusters aboard the Voyager 1 spacecraft have successfully fired up after 37 years without use. Voyager 1, NASA's farthest and fastest spacecraft, is the only human-made object in interstellar space, the environment between the stars. The spacecraft, which has been flying for 40 years, relies on small devices called thrusters to orient itself so it can communicate with Earth. These thrusters fire in tiny pulses or puffs lasting me milliseconds, just enough to subtly rotate the spacecraft so that its antenna is pointing towards our planet. Now, the Voyager team have discovered they're able to use a set of four backup thrusters which have been dormant since 1980. Since 2014, mission managers have noticed that the thrusters Voyager 1's been using to orient the spacecraft, known as attitude control thrusters, have been slowly but steadily degrading. Over time, the thrusters are requiring more puffs to give off the same amount of energy. And the problem is, at 21 billion kilometres from the Earth, there's no mechanic nearby for road surface. Plus, you'd need to be standing next to the vehicle at the time. So the Voyager team at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, set up a team of experts to study the problem. They analysed a range of options and predicted how the spacecraft would respond in different scenarios, and eventually all agreed on an unusual solution. Namely, giving the job of orientation to a set of thrusters that have been asleep for the past 37 years. The Voyager flight team dug up decades-old data and examined the software that was coded in an outdated assembler language in order to make sure they could safely test the thrusters. You see, in the early days of the mission, Voyager 1 flew by Jupiter and Saturn and carefully studied some of the moons around each of these planets. To accurately fly by and point the spacecraft's instrument at the smorgasbord of targets, mission managers use trajectory correction maneuver or TCM thrusters that are identical in size and functionality to the attitude control thrusters. But because Voyager 1's last planetary encounter was Saturn, the Voyager team hadn't used the TCM thrusters since November 8, 1980. Back then, the TCM thrusters were being used in a more continuous firing mode. They had never been used for the brief burst needed to simply orient the spacecraft. All of Voyager's thrusters were developed by Aerojet Rocketdyne. They're the same MR-103 model thrusters which have flown on more recent NASA spacecraft, such as Cassini and Dawn. So the Voyager engineers have now fired up the four TCM thrusters for the first time in 37 years in order to test their ability to orient the spacecraft using 10 millisecond pulses. The team waited eagerly as the test results travelled through space, taking 19 hours and 35 minutes to reach the antenna at the Goldstone Deep Space Communications Complex in California. And the news was great. The TCM thrusters worked perfectly, just as well as the attitude control thrusters. The plan going forward is to switch to Voyager 1's TCM thrusters in January. But to make the change, Voyager has to turn on a heater for each thruster, which requires power, a very limited resource for this ageing mission. When there's no longer enough power to operate the heaters, the team will switch back to the attitude control thrusters. The thruster test went so well on Voyager 1, the team will now do a similar test on the TCM thrusters of its twin Voyager 2 spacecraft. Good news is the attitude control thrusters being used in Voyager 2 aren't as degraded as those on Voyager 1. Voyager 1 was launched from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida on September 5, 1977, on its grand tour of the outer solar system. It became the first spacecraft to cross the heliopause boundary, entering interstellar space in August 2012 at a distance of 121 astronomical units. That's more than 16 light hours from the Sun. By the way, an astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. In about 40,000 years from now, long after Voyager 1 will no longer be operational, it'll pass within 1.6 light years of the star Gliese 445. If Star Trek movies are correct, it'll be usurped by a friendly but very angry sentient alien being and sent back to Earth on a mission of destruction. 
Meanwhile, Voyager 2, which is now about 17 billion kilometres from Earth, will pass within 1.7 light years of the star Ross 248, also within about 40,000 years' time. And I certainly hope we'll be able to report it when it happens right here on Space Time. The United States is returning humans to the moon. President Donald Trump this week signed Space Policy Directive 1 at the White House, which is designed to refocus national space policy with a US-led integrated program with the private sector and international partners for a human return to the moon, followed by manned missions to Mars and beyond. The president describes it as a first step for returning American astronauts to the moon for the first time since 1972. He stressed that America won't just be planting the stars and stripes and leaving footprints, but will establish a foundation which can be used for an eventual mission to Mars and worlds beyond. The new policy has grown out of a unanimous recommendation by the newly set up National Space Council, chaired by Vice President Mike Pence. The policy also ends NASA's existing efforts to send humans to an asteroid, something which many experts have always said could be done just as easily through a robotic mission. The President revived the National Space Council in July to advise and help implement his space policy with exploration as a national priority. Of course, having the vision and having the money to carry out that vision are two very different things, as pretty well every US President has found out. And working towards the new directive will be reflected in NASA's 2019 fiscal year budget request next year. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you're a sky watcher, and most people who listen to this show are, you've probably noticed that the night skies are getting brighter. And it's our increased efforts to get rid of inefficient incandescent lighting, replacing them with eco-friendly LED lights, that's become part of the problem. A report in the journal Science Advances claims the energy efficiency of LED lighting means we're both keeping them on longer and also installing them in places that have never had lighting before. In fact, between 2012 and 2016, the artificially lit area of the Earth's surface grew by 2.2% per year. And the increase is probably far worse than we know, because the satellites used to monitor the increase aren't really all that sensitive to the blue light wavelengths emitted by LED lights. LEDs use just a fraction of the energy of traditional incandescent lighting. A 20-watt LED generates as much energy as a 100-watt incandescent light, meaning an 80% savings in energy and it lasts up to 20 times as long, representing an even greater savings. But interestingly, people are responding to the improved efficiencies not by cutting costs, but by adding more lights and replacing the ones they now have with brighter lighting. The shifts having profound consequences for both human health and the environment. The rapid increase in nighttime lighting is having a dramatic impact on animal life, which lacks the ability to adapt to the additional stresses imposed. Also, LEDs emit shorter wavelength light, which has a more bluish tone to it. And because human eyes are especially sensitive to this type of light, it's led to an increase in human health problems such as sleeping disorders. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. Now, light pollution has been a problem for a long time, particularly for astronomers, but now it's becoming a problem for humanity. And the reason is that the world is getting brighter. And, uh, Fred, the reason it's getting brighter is because we've become technologically advanced and we're using different kinds of lighting. Absolutely right. And, of course, um, light pollution is uh, one of the things that I spend a lot of my time thinking about because it's an important part of my job with the Australian Astronomical Observatory to keep our skies dark. The skies above the telescopes at Siding Spring Observatory in northwestern New South Wales, Australia, they are pristine. They are as dark as they were 50 or 60,000 years ago when the first people started looking at the sky from that place. It's different, though, when you look at the horizon. We've got blobs of light on the horizon that come from things like coal fields. They come from cities. We can actually see the lights of Sydney on our horizon, even though it's about 350 kilometres away, line of sight. Mm. So that's all very much part of my job. And of course, very much the focus of an 
astronomer. And it has to be said that the current growing awareness of the ills of light pollution really had its origins in the world of astronomy back actually in the 1980s, uh, 70s and 80s, when astronomers, principally in places like Arizona, where there are big telescopes, California, where there are big telescopes, where they, astronomers realized that they were losing the night sky because of the encroachment of cities and the amount of light that was there. And that led to something called the International Dark Sky Association, which is the principal advocacy body for dark skies. A good example of it is um, when you stand in the middle of a major metropolitan centre, and I did actually test this when I was in New York. I looked up. I wanted yep. to see the, the stars, and there was nothing. Yeah, that's uh, right. Because of the light pollution, it just blocks everything out. It's, it's a staggering effect. Indeed, and New York's um, a particularly interesting case because probably about a couple of years ago, they had major power blackouts and people could see the Milky Way mm. and stars. And basically, uh, radio stations and TV stations were getting calls from worried listeners and viewers saying, what's all that stuff in the sky? <laughs> we don't know what that is. There's stuff invading us. Ah. Yeah. And, and I've spoken to people who've come to the country from Sydney for the first time and they just go, the sky is amazing at night. Yes. Well, to us, it's just normal. It's normal, that's right. So there's a little bit more to say about this, and I might just mention, before we talk about the details, that the issue of light pollution is now widely recognised as being so much more than just astronomers. It affects all living species on Earth that are in urban environments, you know, near places where there's a lot of light. Things like crop pollination is being threatened because we realise now that um, if you've got artificial light, the insects that normally do the pollination don't like it and they either go away or they die or they basically just stop. Mm. Trees in brightly lit areas actually go into bud in springtime up to a week earlier than they do in darker areas. It's clearly affecting their circadian cycle. And we've known for a long time that um, something like 2 billion birds a year get wiped out just because of New York State. Uh, the lights there. These are migrating birds. They head off looking for whatever they're looking for, come across a city, and they either crash into buildings or they just fly around them in orbit until they drop uh, yeah. because they're lost. Yeah, uh, terrible that. stuff. Mm. Yeah. And, and they, it was only recently they figured out that was the problem. Uh, up until uh, you know some it, it, years ago, they, they did, right. had no idea why this was happening. Yes, exactly. And two other ways that it affects perhaps the dominant species on Earth ourselves, we now know that light that's rich in blue, and that's, you know, light that comes from really white source, it's got richness in blue light there. That is really bad for us in terms of disrupting our circadian rhythms, which are vitally important. We've evolved these over hundreds of thousands of years, and we've evolved in an, an environment that gets dark at night and bright during the day and our systems are all set up for that with very little room for tinkering around which is what we're now doing and we've seen that some of these disruptions actually lead to uh, very serious illnesses to the extent that last year the American Medical Association actually designated something called the detrimental effects of poorly designed high intensity LED lighting and the LEDs of course light emitting diodes are what we are now seeing being rolled out across the world for yeah. urban lighting, as well as in our own homes and as well as on the headlights of our cars and all the rest of it. And they are so, significantly brighter. They are, and, and they're cheaper to run. They don't use as much energy and they last a heck of a lot longer. You can't, you, you know, you can't blame people for, of course, for, for, for using going them. this way, but we are now starting to see the effect of that and it's uh, it's not good. That's right. And just one postscript about LEDs. In many ways, I think the technology has been rolled out too early. And the reason is that these days to get a high, well, it's not quite true now because the technology is moving on. But if you look back a few years when a lot of this rollout was taking place, two or three years, the high intensity LEDs that were used, to get the highest efficiency, you give them a lot of blue light. So they are very rich in blue light, the high efficiency LEDs. They're cheap to run, but they're very bad for us. And not only that, actually, they're bad for the environment because blue light is the one that spreads around much more readily than red light. So that's the background. And what we now have is a kind of global map which has come from a US spacecraft. It is one that's been surveying the Earth for many, many years. It's called uh, Suomi NPP. It's a weather satellite. And it's got an instrument on board it which actually looks down at the Earth and basically just measures the brightness of what 
what it's seeing beneath. And what's happened is over the last decade, there has been a 2% per, I beg your pardon, over the last five years, there's been a 2% per year increase in the in the brightness of the earth. That's amazing. So it's, yeah, over that short time. And this is a surprise to the scientists who have carried out this work. And the reason it's a surprise is because of what we've just been talking about. This rollout of LEDs, which have got very high efficiency in the blue, they should have made the world look bluer. And it turns out that Suomi, the spacecraft, is not sensitive to blue light. And so what they expected to see was a reduction in the amount of light coming from the Earth because the Suomi spacecraft is sensitive to light that's sort of more red than kind of greeny orange. But it doesn't see the blue. It just sees the orange, the green, the orange, and the red colours of the spectrum and a little bit into the infrared. Mm. And it, So they expected that those kind of lights, that, like the sodium lights, the old yellow street lights that we're all familiar with, they're being phased out. They expected that that would produce a reduction in the amount of light that Suomi sees because the blue light, it's not sensitive to the blue light and all our street lighting is now a bluer in colour. But they're surprised to see, no, it's increasing across the board. And what that tells you is that LEDs are so successful in terms of providing cheap lighting that lighting authorities have said, oh, well, we'll just put more lighting yeah, exactly in. Exactly right, yeah. We can run more lights for the same price. Yeah. And so the whole world is getting brighter. There are a few places that aren't. They are the war zones of the world. Syria is one. The outdoor lighting issue, I think, is one that really needs to be addressed. We find that there's been a very rapid increase, particularly in countries where up till now there's been no lighting, like northern India, for example. We've got villages there that haven't had electricity. Now with LEDs and cheap electricity, they can be illuminated. But sadly, the lighting engineering world has not caught up with the fact that it's very easy to make lights night sky friendly, and that is by fully shading them. You shade them so that no direct light goes upwards. But unfortunately, a lot of light fittings, even the ones designed today in our highly uh, informed uh, environment, even the ones designed today, throw a lot of light up into the sky and that's where it does the damage. That's mm. where it stops you seeing the stars and affects migrating birds and all the rest of it. That's Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. The European Space Agency is moving forward with plans to develop new versions of its Vega rocket launch system as well as a new reusable capsule to take payloads into orbit and return them safely to the Earth again. ESA's new plans were kicked off with formal contract signing ceremonies with Italy's ELV and Thales Alenia Space to upgrade Europe's Vega rocket launch system and develop the new Space Rider reusable spacecraft. As part of the contract, ELV will develop and test a new liquid-fueled upper-stage engine to replace Vega's existing Sephiro 9 solid-fueled third-stage and liquid-fueled Avum fourth-stage motors. It's hoped the new system will be ready for use by 2025. The new cryogenic engine will use a low-cost liquid oxygen and methane propulsion system. The new motor will need to match the performance of the two existing Vega upper-stages with increased flexibility and lower costs. ELV will also investigate how existing motors could be used to create a family of Vega configurations capable of placing payloads up to 2.5 tonnes into orbit. The 30 metre tall Vega currently uses solid fuel rockets for its first three stages, with a liquid fueled fourth stage. Liquid fueled engines can be turned on and off multiple times and have the power output adjusted, giving them considerable flexibility over solid fuel motors which can only be ignited the once and then have to be left to fire at full thrust until they're empty. The existing Vega rocket is designed to deliver payloads of up to 1,500 kilograms to low Earth polar orbits at altitudes of up to 700 kilometres. 
In parallel, Thales Alenia Space and ELV will continue development work on the European Space Agency's new Space Rider reusable spacecraft. The Space Rider transportation system will be integrated with Vega, combining an orbital service module derived from the Vega Avium with a re-entry module derived from the IXV Intermediate Experimental Vehicle Demonstrator flown aboard Vega in 2015. Space Rider will give Europe a reusable capsule for routine access and return from space carrying payloads of up to 800 kilograms into orbit. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. China's 15th launch for 2017 has successfully carried Algeria's first telecommunications satellite into orbit. A Long March 3B rocket flew the dual-purpose Alcomsat-1 into geostationary transfer orbit from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in Sichuan Province. The mission had been delayed two years because of problems building the two Algerian ground stations needed to control the spacecraft. China has one more launch slated for this year. A Long March 2D rocket will take off later this month, carrying two SuperView-1 Earth observation satellites from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A Soyuz rocket carrying a secret military spy satellite has successfully blasted into orbit from the Plus S Cosmodrome in Russia's far north. The Soyuz 21B was carrying a classified Lotus S-1 signals intelligence satellite for the Russian Defense Ministry. Once in its 915km high orbit, the Lotus S-1 number 803 was renamed Cosmos 2524. Lotus satellites are part of Russia's classified Liana program. The program is designed to modernize Moscow's Signet electronic signals intelligence gathering capabilities. The mission was the fourth launch this year from Pesesk. Interestingly, it came just a week after the failure of another Soyuz 21B from the nation's new Viscosny Cosmodrome in the country's Far East. Moscow's decision to proceed with this latest launch indicates that investigators are fairly certain they know the cause of the earlier Viscosny failure. That's thought to centre around the inputting of the wrong programming flight data aboard the space control systems of the frigate upper stage. It was that bad programming which caused the rocket to go off course, re-entering the atmosphere and burning up over the North Atlantic Ocean with a total loss of its multi-million dollar 19 satellite payload. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news this week in the Science Report. Scientists are keeping a close eye on a new bird flu strain developing in China, just in case the virus goes pandemic. A report in the journal Cell Host and Microbe warns that it's a highly pathogenic version of an 87N9 virus capable of replicating efficiently in human cells. The new strain's been found to pass between mammals simply through breathing. In previous H7N9 epidemics, the low pathogenic version of the virus was still able to kill about 40% of those infected. A new study has recommended that planet Earth has entered a new geological age, the Anthropocene Epoch, which scientists say is real and should be formally recognised. If accepted, the Anthropocene, or Age of Humans, will be added to the geological timescale. The findings were submitted by the 35-member Anthropocene Working Group, The groups confirmed that the scale of human impact on our planet has changed the course of Earth's history. Scientists say they identified numerous changes in the Earth system that characterised the geological Anthropocene, including significant impact on factors controlling the change in global climate, sea levels and the biosphere. The findings suggest the Holocene no longer serves to adequately constrain the rate and magnitude of changes to the planet. Rapid changes to the planet include acceleration of rates of erosion and sedimentation, large-scale chemical perturbations to the cycles of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and other elements, the inception of significant changes to global climate and sea level, and biological changes including unprecedented levels of species invasions and deaths across the Earth. The findings suggest that the Anthropocene should now follow on from the Holocene epoch that has seen 11.7 thousand years of relative environmental stability since the retreat of the last ice age. 
The team recommends that, geologically speaking, the mid-20th century represents the most sensible level for the beginning of the Anthropocene, as it brought in large global changes to many of Earth's fundamental chemical cycles, as well as large amounts of novel materials such as plastics, concrete and aluminum, all of which will help build the strata of the future. The Anthropocene Working Group is now focusing on finding a golden spike, a sort of reference level within recent strata that best characterised the changes of the Anthropocene. One of the leading contenders for this signpost is plutonium fallout from atomic bomb tests in the 1950s, which can be found in sediments around the globe, thereby providing an easily identifiable marker. Other proposals include remnant plastics or carbon signatures pointing to the rapid rise in CO2 emissions. For an Anthropocene epoch to be formally added to the official timeline of Earth's history, the chronostratigraphic chart, it will need to firstly be approved by the International Commission on Stratigraphy and then ratified by the International Union of Geological Sciences. A report by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare has taken a snapshot of the nation's use of illegal drugs. The National Drug Strategy Household Survey found that at least one in eight Australians used at least one illegal substance in the past 12 months. The most commonly used illegal substance was cannabis, which is used by about 10.4% of the population. That was followed by cocaine, 2.5%, ecstasy, 2.2%, and methamphetamines, meaning ice or speed, about 1.4%. Interestingly, the Northern Territory had the highest proportion of illegal drug users, with some 20.5% of the population imbibing, compared to the national average of 15.5%. The survey also found that gay and bisexual people were some six times more likely to use ecstasy or methamphetamine compared to straight people. They were also four times more likely to use cocaine and three times more likely to use cannabis or misuse prescription drugs. The survey also found that people who were unemployed were three times more likely to use methamphetamines compared to employed people. However, people with jobs were far more likely to use cocaine. As well as looking at illicit drug use, the survey also analysed tobacco and alcohol use, finding 12.7% of Australians still smoke despite the known cancer health risks. 8 out of 10 Australians said they consumed alcohol in the past 12 months, however only 5.9% admitted consuming alcohol on a daily basis. The study also found that tobacco causes more illness and premature death than any other drug, and alcohol-related admissions to hospital are higher than those related to illicit drugs. The study estimated that in 2011, the last year for which data was available, there were 18,762 tobacco-related deaths, 6,570 alcohol-related deaths and 1,926 deaths related to the use of illicit drugs. The study also found that 10% of alcohol drinkers admitted drink driving and 85% of people supported legislative changes to permit the use of cannabis for medical purposes. Scientists have sequenced the genetic makeup of the thylacine or Tasmanian tiger, finding the carnivorous marsupial was already under genetic stress at the time it was hunted to extinction. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Ecology and Evolution, are based on DNA extracted from a preserved thylacine pup. Scientists found thylacines already suffered from very limited genetic diversity when humans first reached Australia. The research indicates they had reached a sort of genetic bottleneck during an ice age period between 120 and 70,000 years ago and rising seas isolated Tasmania from mainland Australia around 14,000 years ago, providing additional genetic stress for the local thylacine population. Radiocarbon dating of thylacine bones has revealed the species survived in isolated pockets of southern parts of the Australian mainland until between 8 and 3,000 years ago, a period which coincided with a dramatic change in weather patterns, and the Tasmanian population underwent a similar crash at about the same time. Still, they managed to somehow hold on, until, that is, they were finally hunted to extinction because of vote-hungry politicians kowtowing to farmers who wrongly accused the thylacine of killing their sheep. The last living thylacine died all alone in the Hobart Zoo in 1936. Despite all the hype in the popular media over the past few days, scientists say the likelihood of doing a Jurassic Park and resurrecting the extinct species from the DNA is still an awful long way off. New climate change projections suggest that winds will decrease across parts of the Northern Hemisphere. The findings reported in the journal Nature Geoscience mean less power available for wind farms. Since many countries are including wind power as part of their Paris Climate Agreement emission reductions, the researchers say governments need to factor in how the future climate will change energy resources. The new data suggests that the warming Arctic will shift winds south, meaning fewer winds for countries like the US, the UK and parts of Asia, but more windy conditions in the tropical and southern hemisphere regions, including parts of Australia. Scientists have found the ideal speed for pouring espresso into milk. 
Using liquids that mimic espresso and milk, researchers tested a variety of pouring speeds, finding that the second liquid needed to be added to the first at a speed above 21 centimetres per second in order to get those lovely creamy brown layers under the foam. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Communications, could help manufacturers develop new ways of creating layers in soft materials for industrial processes. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Times also broadcasts coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 